So I'm at the University of Manitoba, and I study polar bears. I work with Polar Bears International, the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance, and Environment and Climate Change Canada to try to understand how and when polar bears might be able to adapt to climate change. And I'm going to be sharing some of my work with you today. Uh, first, I'd like to start with some basics on polar bear biology. There are approximately 20 to 25,000 polar bears worldwide. Um, they are found in the Arctic. Um, and they're broken into 19 different populations for management purposes. Canada has approximately two thirds of all polar bears. We have 13 subpopulations in our borders, and you can see they're ranged here on the map. And I'm going to, sh going to be showing you this map several times, so just uh, keep it in mind that Canadian polar bears are front and center. Um, ice, as many of you probably know, is very important for polar bears. Mating occurs on the ice, and once polar bears have mated, females will care for their cubs for about three years. So um, that's a big investment for polar bears, and they need a lot of energy to do that. The other thing that happens on ice is feeding. Uh, ringed and bearded seals form the primary components of polar bear diets. Um, they do have other diets, dietary sources like uh, harbor seals and walruses. Um, and these they all hunt while they're on the ice. So they punch down through the ice to get seal pups, um, and that is their primary source of nutrition. When polar bears are on land, they're often fasting. Um, they will sometimes scavenge through um, other kills and also through town dumps, but this is a very small portion of their diet. And so when polar bears are constrained to the land because there's no sea ice um, in the summer months, they are fasting, and as you can imagine, that has a pretty big physiological impact on them. Polar bears are adapted to life on ice, and when I talk about adaptation, what I mean is evolved changes in either physical or genetic traits that provide some kind of benefit towards survival or uh, reproduction. And so an adapted individual is one that either survives better or produces more offspring. Um, and a maladapted individual is one that doesn't survive as well. Polar bears have lots of adaptations towards living on the ice. For example, they have big teeth that will um, grab onto a seal and eat their blubber. They have really big fuzzy paws to cope with walking through ice and snow. And of course, they have white fur to blend in with their landscape. What's a little harder to measure is genetic adaptations. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So, as you can see, sea ice is very important towards polar bear life. This is an image of the North Pole um, in 1979 in September. So this is this, the least amount of ice throughout the year that the North Pole will experience. If I go to 2022 in the same month, you can see that about half the sea ice has been lost. And this is due to warming temperatures from climate change. And so if I toggle back and forth, you can see there is a huge loss of sea ice. And this, of course, poses a problem for polar bears. Sea ice loss is harmful for polar bears. We know from a variety of studies that if sea, if sea ice is less off, occurring less often in the Arctic, polar bears will have reduced access to seals. And they will also experience longer fasting periods because they spend more time on the sea ice, or more time off the sea ice. These combine to reduce the survival of cubs, so mothers who are starving or have less nutrition to feed their, uh, their offspring, and cubs will not survive as well in years when we have less sea ice available for them. There's also more disease exposure when polar bears are stuck on land. They're also more exposed to pollution. And there's more conflict with humans because they're more likely to go through town dumps to find sources of food. In fact, Churchill, Manitoba, which is where I do some of my work, has a polar bear jail for polar bears who are causing a problem and scavenging in the dump. And so all of these are ways that sea ice loss can be harmful towards polar bears. So what I'm interested in understanding is how can polar bears adapt to this sea ice loss, or can they even adapt? Uh, my PhD was on plants, and when I was looking at adaptation in plants, you take a bunch of plants, you grow them in different environments, and you see who survives better, who produces more offspring. That's really hard to do with polar bears. Aside from all the ethics issues, they're just not that amenable to growing themselves where you want them to grow. 
So I had to take a different approach to study adaptation. So let's say we have a case of sea ice loss and we have three different types of polar bears. Let's say that that blue polar bear produces four offspring in years with bad ice. The yellow polar bear produces three offspring and the red polar bear produces only a single individual. We can then say that the polar bear with the blue background is probably adapting to sea ice loss, whereas the polar bear with the red background is probably maladapted. Luckily for us, we can do this in a way using their DNA. And so if we look at the genetic backgrounds of different polar bears, we can assess where in the landscape genetic backgrounds are most common and if they are more or less likely to adapt to sea ice loss through climate change. So we know a few things from evolutionary principles. We know that adaptation, so your capacity to actually adapt, depends on genetic diversity. Let's say we have an allele change, and you can think of this as a genetic change, um, look, and sea ice loss, where we go from a circle allele to a square allele. These are not very scientific, but just bear with me. How likely you are to be able to make that jump depends on your underlying genetic variation. This is because if you have more genetic variation, you have more material to work with to create those adaptations. And so we can look at the amount of genetic variation in different polar bear groups to see which groups are more or less likely to be able to adapt. And so this is what we did. So here on the uh, y-axis, I'm showing you genetic diversity. So this is a measure of variation. And on the x-axis, I'm showing you polar bear populations. And these correspond to these groups in the Canadian Arctic. And what we see is that it's the polar bears in the most, most northern parts of the Canadian Arctic that have the lowest amounts of genetic diversity. And so this suggests that these groups might be less likely to be able to adapt to changing conditions through sea ice loss. We can also take a look at gen the genetics of maladaptation. So if you're la not likely to be able to adapt, and we can do this using DNA. So if we have our different DNA sequences, our genetic backgrounds, and we map those across different environments where they're found, we see, for example, that the red allele or the red genetic background occurs at low frequencies on that side of the environment and higher frequencies on the other side. We can then combine that with climate models that look at predicted changes in environment, so sea ice loss, under different emission scenarios. So this, what I mean by this is if we have lots of emissions, we're going to have more warming and less sea ice. If we have fewer emissions because we're doing a green strategy, we'll have lower temperatures and possibly more ice. So then we can combine these into a model using uh, machine learning, and we can look at how that genetic frequency or the allele frequency changes in those new predicted environments. And so here, these new frequencies are showing in the square. We're assuming that the bigger the change, the more likely you are to become maladapted. This is because we're assuming that polar bears right now in their current state are adapted to life on sea ice. So if they're shifting away from that optimum, they are more likely to become maladapted. And so this is one way that we can assess the risk of maladaption, maladaptation. And so this is what I did. I took my polar bear, so I had 411. I'm showing you a, a map of the study area. And I, I looked at where we might find hot spots of maladaptation. And consistent with what we saw for genetic variation, it's those bears in the high Arctic in the north there that are showing the most amounts of uh, maladaptation risk. And so by those warm colors, we can see that the bears in the north are probably not going to be able to adapt to uh, sea ice loss. So not looking good for northern bears, not looking good for bears in general, especially northern bears. Um, and I want to share with you one other piece of information that we've recently come up with. Uh, and this is looking at only one population. I've highlighted it in, in red. And we looked at stress in polar bears as measured by aging rates. And this is actually talked about a little bit. If you're more um, stressed, you're more likely to age faster than your chronological age. And we can measure that using epigenetics. And so what we did was we correlated this with the length of the ice-free season. So this means how much time bears are spending off the ice. 
which you can see by that blue line, has increased from about 130 days to about 190 days. We then correlated that with aging rate. And what we found is that bears um, are aging faster through time. And this is pretty strongly correlated with the amount of time they're spending off ice. And so this is another line of evidence to show that um, sea ice loss is contributing to stress and potentially maladaptation in polar bears. So to get back to my initial question, can polar bears adapt to sea ice loss? Probably not. And I wish I had a better or more hopeful message to share with you, but this is a species that is very adapted to sea ice loss. And realistically, we're not going to have a lot of sea ice in the Arctic. Um, so what we need to do going forward is we need to find a balance between conserving those adaptable populations and preserving those vulnerable populations. So do we preserve the populations that are most likely to survive? Or do we go for those ones that are most at risk? And this is a really hard balance to answer. Um, this is what we hope to be able to use genetics to help guide our way. So with that, I have a ton of people. More than the list is listed here. Um, but I, I am funded by NSERC, so I will just call out to them. And I don't think we're doing questions. So thanks for listening to my talk. Thanks.